Uh, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bento Box. Um, my background, my entire career, what has been in design for the past decade and before starting Bento Box. And um, I found that transition from moving from a designer to becoming a CEO to be um, really challenging, but really exciting. And I, 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 it was, I'm a first time CEO and there was a lot of things I learned along the way in terms of um, how to translate uh, skills from being a designer to uh, being a CEO and building a successful company and building Bento Box. And so that's sort of what I wanna share with you guys today is um, taking some of those challenges and those gaps that uh, someone in, for example, the design field may have when transitioning to a leadership role like becoming a CEO and how to turn those into advantages um, to be able to grow a successful business. So just a little background on Bento Box. Um, we help transform restaurants into better businesses online. Uh, the way that we do that is through a connected suite of tools that's focused around their website. And the reason that we focus on the restaurant's website is over the past like 15, 20 years, as technologies become more important in the dining out experience, restaurants didn't really have the tools to be able to translate that amazing experience that you had in the restaurant um, online. And so because they didn't have these tools, these other third parties like Seamless, Yelp, OpenTable came in, they gave them these tools, but they took away that one-to-one -one relationship with the guests, which is really one of the most important things in the hospitality experience. And restaurants really suffered because of it, and they, um, it really hurt their business and it really hurt their revenue. So with Bento Box, we're um, aiming to solve that. We start with the restaurant's website, because that's the only place online they have complete control of their brand. And we give them a CMS that's, that's hospitality focused, so they can do really obvious things like update menus and press. But then we go a step further to build in revenue driving tools, so the website becomes an actual uh, like extension of their business. So they can sell gift cards, take catering orders, sell tickets for like a New Year's Eve event. Um, and and it, it makes a real impact on their bottom line. And so just in terms of where we're at today, we have over 1,600 restaurants um, worldwide. Uh, we have a team of about 45 people here in New York. And we've grown consider consider considerably over the past year, about 350%. We're really lucky to work with some of the best restaurants in the world, literally from 11 Madison Park to Luke's Lobster to Union Square Cafe. Um, so it's been a, a really, really great experience. And in that experience, I've really come to believe that designers are really well positioned to become excellent CEOs and build successful businesses. Um, but that hasn't been the popular belief. Like over time, um, we've seen CEOs have backgrounds in like finance, operations, legal, engineering. And this is a, a study I found from Forbes a couple years ago. And nowhere on that list was design listed at all. But I think in um, more recent times, we're finding that design-driven companies can actually be extremely successful and design-driven leadership has a real major impact. And so um, we're seeing that in companies like Airbnb and Envision and Kickstarter. And um, I think that they've cracked the code in terms of how to take their design skills and apply them to growing a company. And so that's just, if I wanna go through three different challenges that I found um, in that transition and how I approach them through just some anecdotes about uh, relating to Bento Box. By the way, there's, there's like a, you know when you're on the cell phone and you can like hear yourself and it's, it's real hard, <laughs> I'm having a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, all right, uh, so the first challenge is uh, lack of finance and business skills. Um, you know, this, this, this is something really obvious. The first time that I ever opened a spreadsheet in my life was after Bento Box became incorporated. Um, I almost wanted to like make a business model in Photoshop. It felt like easier to me in some way, <laughs> you know? And, 
Um, you know, and that, all those tactical things like, you know, spreadsheets and ROI and CAC and LTV, the, you know, you can learn the definition of those, but actually applying those to your business and strategizing around how to make that work is, um, is a challenge. And what I found was taking the, the skills that a designer has to, you know, create something tangible was a really, it was one way that I was able to um, help build, like build the business model for Bento Box. So what, you know, if you think about, if you're trying to strategize around how to build the business and you think about the design process and taking, you know, designers love to work within parameters and have a process and taking that same method of thinking and using your skills to create something tangible to get you those parameters. So what I mean is, um, Back in 2013, when I was first starting, uh, actually wasn't even starting Bento Box. I had I was working as a freelance designer, had a bunch of restaurants as clients, and it became very obvious that there was like a set of things that all of those restaurants needed that the tools out there didn't address. Um, and so uh, I was talking to the meatball shop about their website, and I literally mocked up this like fake CMS, like just totally created out of nothing, took it to them, took it to a bunch of other restaurants, and, and, and was able to find out, you know, how much will you pay for this? How long is the sales cycle? How much does this cost to acquire? And I was able to get a lot of those parameters by just literally designing, taking this one skill I had, which is to design the CMS, not even build it. I just had like JPEGs and I was like, aren't you excited about this? They're like, yeah, I'll buy it. <laughs> and, uh, and I started being able to put together like a real business model based off of that. So um, that was one way that I was able to like move forward in, a, in an area that I had like absolutely no, um, no skills in and no background in. So another thing is just, uh, I mean, this was one I really struggled with, was an introverted disposition. And this doesn't mean like I had tons of friends, love being social, but the idea of uh, the amount of energy it took to get people like inspired, excited, get them to do what they want, get them to want to join the company, all of that was, it, it was like a huge struggle. Um, and, and just learning how to be able to uh, design an environment where I could be a great leader, but, it, from, but having a background where that wasn't something that came really easily to me. And so one thing that I leaned into was I just remember that design is really ultimately about people, about understanding them deeply, their motivations, and um, that, that I could use that and design an environment where people would get excited and inspired, but it didn't have to come from me. So, for example, um, every Friday we have uh, this all hands, and I do I say a few little things, but um, the major part of it is we go around the entire team and everyone thanks someone on the team, and they talk about one thing that they're proud or excited about, like proud of that they did or excited about that happened. And it gets everyone so pumped, and I barely have to do anything, and it's really awesome. <laughs> and it really creates this culture that celebrates the team, and it makes it more about them. And so I can get the same result that I was terrified of by being, you know, uh, uh, like an inspiring, uh, motivating leader, but actually getting my, my team to do the work for me. And I designed that. And so going back to, like, being able to like create that out of nothing is, is, and having those design skills to be able to design that would, became really, really valuable. And the last part, last thing is uh, that was a challenge is the idea of just being specialized in one thing and um, really being specialized in design and having sort of, not narrow in a bad way, but a very narrow specialized way of thinking. And uh, the requirement in transitioning to CEO was really like thinking exponentially larger than that. And that's really hard. And just at the, the go-to was to focus on the details. And so the way that I approached that was really uh, going again back to those design skills and um, thinking about the design and thinking about how to 
design the whole system as 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 one larger uh, uh, like system, for lack of a better word. So I started approaching business problems and business issues the same way that I would approach design and being able to like break them down to, into smaller pieces and arrive at a strategy. So for example, this is gonna be a little tricky for me, so hold on. There we go. I was thinking about our 2018 uh, strategy, you know, a couple months ago. And this is, <laughs> this is a dashboard of a car because I was driving back from, or my husband was driving back from Thanksgiving. But I started just like on the yellow note cards, just started, or post-its, just started writing any insight I had about the business, an insight, a threat, just anything that came to my mind. And then from there, started bucketing those into like more concrete themes and then bucketing them down again. And what's hilarious is this like gradient <laughs> color of the postcards just happened naturally. But what I was able to arrive at um, through that process was really the five things that we're focusing on as a company this year. Um, and that all came from that just doing a brain dump, which is really how I ended up wood design, like just going through all of the different options and bucketing and bucketing and bucketing together to arrive at a more concrete strategy. And now everyone at our company, any decision that they're making for 2018 needs to meet one of these criteria. Um, so, really being able to take that, those skills and be able to scale that to think about a larger system um, was the, the big takeaway and it just makes it less scary. And the one final thought I wanted to mention while I was up here about that transition from being a designer to being the CEO is just making sure that you really want it and you know, there's that desire to build like a great product that everybody loves and, and people will use it, but you need to want to build that and grow it massively, very quickly and efficiently. And all of those other parameters have to be just as important as designing a great product that people love. And you have to really own that. You can't think that you can do it without all those other considerations. Um, so, I think just embracing that entire, that all of those parts of like growing and running a business is just the most important part of it. And that's it. Thanks. Can we do questions now? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Crystal, thank you very much. Thank um, you. So we're going to open up to Q&A. So just raise your hand if you have a question. Um, the first one I'd ask is, um, what, is the, what was the first day after you decided to start Bento Box? What was, the, what was the first day like? What was the first thing that you did as you started a company? Um, that's really, well, I did it a little bit differently. And I think this also goes back to being a designer and being able to uh, create something tangible is I really sold the product before I decided to incorporate it and create it. So I would say that was like the first thing was getting people to pay for what I was creating. So um, it, I think that that's something that it's like, oh, we'll figure that part out later. But there was just a lot and also just being a first time CEO because I didn't have that background. I really needed to prove that I could build something that made money, not just build something. Um, so that was really the, mo the most important first step for me. Hi. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what it's like. <laughs> uh, Can you talk about how you approach building a design team as a design CEO, or as a designer and a CEO? Can you talk about how you built a design team? Yeah, I'm trying to think about the first designer we hired. Um, So we got, we, I think one thing that we're really lucky in being able to build the design team is that um, 
kind of like a sexy thing we're designing for, you know, like food, people like restaurants, they love it. And so we, uh, so uh, really we're trying to get people that had the commercial skills, like agency type of commercial skills um, that could make like really beautiful UIs, but then also have, be able to have the, you know, UX, UI skills um, to be able to work on the back end too, because we, up until very, very recently, we haven't had like different template designers and different bento box marketing designers and different like U UI, UX designers. So um, being able to get people who have that whole set of skills it was really important. And um, I really, I ran the design team up until maybe like three months ago where one of our senior designers um, really stepped up and he's been incredible and, and he's now running the design team. But I would say that up until like maybe a year and a half, two years ago, I was still designing sometimes just because it was just faster. I was just like, it was bad, don't do that, delegate. <laughs> um, but I don't know, I don't think that was a really great answer, but hopefully, you know, it's good. Hi, so um, you were talking a little bit about how as a designer you're very specialized. So um, when transitioning to the more executive role and kind of having to take on a more jack of all trades type thing, how did you decide when I'm gonna take on learning all of this myself in detail as opposed to hiring someone or delegating the task to someone who's kind of an expert in that field, like for example, finance or operations? Yeah, I mean, to an extent, I needed to gain an understanding of every part of the business. And I think that's important. Like, I sold the product. I did support. I onboarded. I, when I, I didn't put the financial model together from scratch, but I was able to manipulate it if I needed to. And so um, uh, I think that the delegation could really only happen once I had a firm understanding of what needed to happen. Um, and so I think at this point, you know, we've gotten to the point where like almost 50 people where we're really hiring people to do one specific job. But in the early days, uh, it was important to do all of those jobs at some level myself to be able to get anybody else. Because, you know, you don't have that much money. It's like you can't hire the best X or the X, best Y. You know, you, you have to really tell them how, what the strategy is and how to do it. And you have to know how to do that yourself first, I believe. Hi there. Whoops. You had said that uh, you visualize your entire strategy. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could give an example of your process by pointing out to something you dealt with and how that visualizing you know, came into use. Well, I mean, there's those post-its. <laughs> that was like pretty pretty visual process. But um, well, one thing that we hmm, I mean in our like last round of funding, um, in terms of like visualizing what uh, VCs to like approach first and the types and, and uh, you know, the types of strategics to be talking to, the types of strategic angels. I mean, there was really like almost a mind map of all of the different types of VCs and they were grouped by like their check size and like the, um, you know, the types of uh, companies they focused on and then look at those companies and are they attached to different, comp different uh, funds and what types of investments do they do? And it became almost like a web of being able to like boil it down to the type of uh, VCs to focus on and not the ones to go after first because in the beginning you go after the ones that you don't really want so you can practice a little bit and then you go after the ones you actually want. So even finding out which ones fell in those buckets was like a really visual kind of almost like mind mapping type of project that I literally did in notebooks. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, who was your biggest mentor and how did you find them? Um, uh, yeah, the mentor part has been, I, 
I mean, I'm going to be like totally honest. I think one thing that I feel like I've like lacked a lot in this in this process is like really great, strong female mentors. And um, it's been a little sad, but it's also been like really inspiring because I know that that's like what the the world is lacking, and that's you know what. I want to make sure that I become because I had such a hard time in finding those kinds of mentors. And I remember there was this woman I reached out to that I had worked with a long time ago, and I wanted to get her advice, and she just like almost didn't have time for me. And and I I I, I experienced that a bunch, and I felt like as women, it was almost like we there was this feeling like the pot was too small, and we like it, there was like this like lack of wanting to help each other out that I found to be really, really hard. And so, um, and then in terms of like uh, male CEOs that I, that I, that I spoke to and that we have a, have a lot that have been like investors and mentors, um, I found that their style didn't really match mine. And so there was a lot I just kind of had to figure out on my own. And I, I feel like that's just so, such a sad, grim reality to say that there aren't really that great, many great mentors, but, um, you know, I feel like my best mentor has been my husband, which I think is like the lamest thing to say up here, but, but he has been, you know, and so um, I really hope a big part if like we do a great job with Bento Box is be being able to become a mentor to other, other entrepreneurs, especially women. Uh, another question for me, and then I'm going to work my way right over to you. How do you decide what features not to build? Um, how many? How do we d figure out what features to build? How do you prioritize which features you're going to build? Um, well, now that we have a little bit of data, um, we, I mean, really, like that uh, that strategy that I showed you. Like a big thing is being able to. Uh, drive revenue and show ROI for our customers. And that's really the, the biggest thing. So anything that actually makes an effect on their bottom line is at the moment, that's, those are the things that we're prioritizing because we found that restaurants respond well. If you can, they'll pay any amount of money if you can make them that back like four or five, 10 X. Hi. Um, my question is a little bit about how you started Bento Box, the decision process to get you there. Um, sorry, what am I trying to say? Did you know you wanted to start it when you were freelancing? Or is that a weird thing? Um, did you go talk to these restaurants with the idea that you were going to launch a product and launch a company, or did it happen organically? And what's your advice for someone who may be trying to start their own thing but isn't really sure what that is yet? Yeah, no, I was very much in that position where it, it wasn't necessarily that I wanted to start my own thing, but I realized that my I was in, um, as a designer, I was in a services business and people were paying for my time. And I and that, that reality was like hard. It was like, uh, I, that's not scalable. I can't like scale myself in that way. And I wanted to find, I wanted to start something where I could actually like scale the skills I had. I didn't really know at that time that, was going to be a bento box. And this just like came, I mean, I was just doing so many, I had that in mind. And with that, in, I think I looked at everything I was doing through that lens. And it just became obvious after the third website I did for a restaurant as like a designer on WordPress that, oh, here's the opportunity. This is a no brainer. They have all the same problems. And, uh, and then I, you know, did that mock up and I was like, will you buy this? And they said, yes. And then it became, it just, everything became really obvious after that. But before that, I had all these ideas of like, I'm going to make a design app or a music app or all these like random obvious things. Um, but uh, this was, I mean, it presented itself as a real problem to solve. And I think that's really important to not go after like the self-fulfilling thing, but just to be able to recognize a real problem. Hi. On that note of uh, starting Bento Box, what did you have to give up? in order to start Bento Box? My life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not really, but kind of. I mean, um, I mean a, a lot, you know, I didn't, I didn't, 
you know, pay myself for years, you know, I lost my apartment, I like wasn't going out with like my friends as much anymore because I, I back to the introverted disposition, I, I, I had so much energy that I had to give to other people during the day. Like I didn't even, I didn't want to like, uh, uh, I didn't want to like interact with anyone at night. Like, so my, my friend circle got smaller, uh, you know, I, I fucked up my credit, like <laughs> a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a really great question. But it was, it was just like worth it, I think, I hope. You know, TBD still, but, <laughs> but um, it, it was very clear to me that this is what I needed to be doing and I could solve this problem and that I was the best person and the most well positioned to solve this problem and that I just had to keep going and that it was, it was gonna, it was gonna work out. Just knew that. Well, Crystal, thank you so much for sharing Thanks. a little bit about your journey with us.